Uh, first thing we need to talk about is what ecology is, right? Um, and ecology is just the study of how organisms are going to interact with each other, but also how they interact with their environment. Okay, so um, when we're looking at this, when we're looking at ecology, uh, the main distinction that we're going to make is uh, whether or not things are living or whether they are non-living. Okay, if they're living, we refer to them as um, biotic factors. And biotic factors are all... Cool. Biotic factors are all of the um, living things that uh, an organism is going to interact with. And so uh, let's take a second and think about the living things. What, what types of living things do you interact with on a daily basis? What? Other humans, yes. Um, now, for the most part, um, in ecology, we call this, the, the important interactions that we're going to look at are the um, interactions for competition, like looking for a mate looking for uh, food, things like that. And if you're talking about other humans uh, or, or interacting with other humans to do that, the term that we use to describe that is intra-specific, right? So something that's intra-specific means within a species. Intra means within and spe uh, specific means species. So uh, intra-specific uh, competition. But then there's also um, competition in less so with humans, but because we kind of like don't have to compete with anything else, uh, any other species. But um, with other species in uh, in the world and on Earth, um, there's inter-specific competition where they also have to compete with other species, right? So intra-specific and inter-specific competition. What other living things do you interact with on a daily basis? Animals. Animals. To do what? Play with them. Play with them? Uh, <laughs> less important for ecology. Mm, what? Eat them. That's the important thing. Okay? Food. I don't want to eat your pets. That's poor judgment. Uh, but food is, uh, most of our food, all of our food um, is, is living, right? Or was at some point. Okay, whether it's a plant or an animal, um, it at one point was living and, and we eat it and it gives us sustenance and stuff like that, right? Um, what else? Yeah. Like, I guess, shelter, sort of? Like, like, Is that living? If an animal lives in the tree or something. Well, then you're just, you're just that's um, competing for the shelter. But the tree, well, okay, living in a tree, because the tree is the thing. Yeah. Eh. Uh, mm, We'll maybe, we'll maybe include that later on, but I wouldn't say for now. Well, other things, other things that, that are living that you interact with on a daily basis. <laughs> Bacteria and, and pathogens, right? <laughs> so you're constantly getting sick from these diseases and pathogens that are living things, right? And we don't really have to worry about it, but uh, there are organisms that have to worry about predators, right? Again, you, you don't really get killed by like a lion or anything like that when you're walking to school, but like it's possible. I mean, not a lion, but a mountain lion, a, a Florida panther, a what? An alligator. Oh, sure, yeah, an alligator eats you on your way to school. That's a thing. 
right? Other humans? That would be like in interest specific. All right. So uh, let's talk about uh, abiotic factors. These are all the non-living things because we know that anytime you put an A in front of something, that means not. So what are our what are our abiotic factors? What? Water. Water. For sure important. What else? Air. air. Also important, yes. We need air. Minerals. Minerals that you'd get from the water and the air. Where else would you, might you get minerals from? If you were a, if you were a plant, where would you get minerals from? Soil, yeah. That's important. Missing the most important one. Sun. Sunlight. Sunlight is our, our primary source of energy. It's like, it's the ultimate source of energy for all life. Uh, and if you didn't have sunlight, then it wouldn't, we wouldn't have life. Because like, uh, second law of thermodynamics says that any uh, transfer of energy has to result, result in some loss of energy as heat. And so if you don't have a constant input of energy, then you can't have life. Because everything would get more or less and less complex. One more. The absence of things. Space. Space, physical space. No, no, not not outer space, <laughs> space. <laughs> like there's there's physical space between me and you right now. Okay, I thought you were outer space. No, not outer space. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so uh, next when we talk about ecology, again we're just kind of getting like the ecology jibber jabber out of the way, uh, all the vocab that you need to know. And there's uh, these things called the levels of ecology. Sort of like an ecology hierarchy, uh, much like the ones that we did for um, for like cells. Say like, okay, you've got um, cells, and then many cells working together would be called a tissue, and then many different tissues working together called an organ, and many different organs working together called an organ system. So in ecology, you've got an individual. That's the lowest thing, and that's just one member of a species. Okay, and then if you have many individuals, we call that a population. Say many individuals of the same species in the same place at the same time. So if we said like uh, the population of Florida, um, that would encompass like, you know, the population of Miami, the population of Tampa, uh, but it's probably just talking about the current population. So like your great, 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 great grandfather who also lived in Florida uh, would not be included in that because it's not the right time, okay? You could include that. You could say like um, the population of Florida in the post-industrial age, right? And like, that's us, right? And it's also probably your great, great, Grandfather, not too many greats in there, but but uh, yeah, right? Probably includes them. Um, you can say the population of the United States, and that would encompass all the states, but if you had talked about the population of Florida, it again wouldn't include those people that live in Georgia or whatever, right? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, population of Florida also, uh, or you would specify like human population of Florida, um, because like it's gotta be one species, uh, so that's not gonna include like your dog or anything like that, even though your dog does live in Florida, it's not the same species, right? Make sense? Okay.
A community is many different populations in the same place at the same time. So for instance, like at Plant High School, we've got a, a, a community living in Plant High School, right? We've got um, all the people that, that come to Plant High School, but then you got like the people who are here all year round, or the not people so much as rats, uh, and like cockroaches and ants and things like that, that, that always live at Plant. And, and so as a community together, we come together to, to form Plant High School in all of its greatness, right? Yeah. No, communities are many species. Let's let's put that. Okay, so many species um, are included. When referring to a community, referring to ours and referring yes. But the important thing to realize is in a community, you still don't talk about the abiotic factors. So no abiotic factors included. How does the community change at Plant High School over the, over the year? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so like the humans get to graduate. What happens in the summertime? Yeah. Yes. And what does that do to the rest of the community? What? Mm -mm. Why? Yeah, the reason why we got rats and ants and stuff and cockroaches is because we leave food everywhere. And so what happens at the summertime is that uh, the rats have to like uh, sc uh, scavenge around for food and stuff and they can't find it. Uh, and, and so they start eating the cockroaches and the cockroach population goes down and the ants don't have as much to live off of and so the cockroaches don't have as much to eat and like the population overall goes down. Even though there's more space for them to sort of you know, run around. Uh, if you stop by in the summer, you might see a rat like crawling across the table or something like that. Whereas you're very unlikely to see that uh, during the year because they know not to do that. In fact, uh, it's about seven o'clock, I would say every night that you can start hearing the rats move around on the ceilings. Uh, so if you stay until seven, go into a classroom and just sit down and sit still a little bit, you hear them scurrying around above you though. They don't really come into the rooms as far as I can tell, at least not my room. Uh, anyways, so uh, that's that's how that's how community works, right? Um, if you want to talk about uh, why that community exists, you oftentimes have to look at the whole ecosystem, and the ecosystem is going to be the community plus all the abiotic stuff. You know, why can uh, mold flourish here? Well, it's because we got leaks, and the leaks allow for water to go in, and then uh, there's there's you know ample moisture then in the walls, and, and um, there's not a lot of sunlight to dry it out, and so therefore um, the mold is going to be able to grow, and then the ants can eat the mold, and you know things things kind of snowball out of control from there, right? All right, uh, and then the last thing is called the biosphere. And the biosphere is going to be all the ecosystems on the planet. And I always like the, uh, the grandeur associated with the term biosphere, the, uh, because like it says like on a planet, whereas like 
and really no other planet has living things on it that we know about. We're just like prepared for that instance where we find a planet and we're like, oh, look, another biosphere. We, we coined that term a long time ago. We knew we would find it. But right now, like, Earth is the only biosphere because the only one with living things on it that we know about, right? Hopefully that won't take too long for us to figure out that there's another uh, planet with living things on it, right? We've got all kinds of space programs and stuff to look for that. Uh, okay, so, um, again, that's all the jibber-jabber. Now we're going to look at, like, more specific things, okay? So perhaps the most rudimentary... Um, concept for ecology is population distribution. And we're going to look at three different population distributions. <laughs> All right, so my three population distributions here. Uh, number one, let's say we're looking at like, I don't know, a shrub of some kind. It's distributed like this. These are, these are shrubs and, and the area in between is land. How would you refer to this distribution? Random, randomly dispersed, right? Not only is it random, but how many of these organisms are living in this uh, fairly large area here? Not many. And so what can we determine about the um, amount of nutrients present? Yeah, so we would say there's poor nutrient concentration. Okay. Now, uh, because it seems that there's you know a random uh, a pattern here where these things are growing, not only is there a poor nutrient concentration, but where there are more nutrients, it seems to be like you know randomly dispersed. There's not uh, uh, any one spot that has way more nutrients than any other spot. Maybe this spot over here that has three, but again, there's not like a giant clump there. It's just three organisms that are living in a relatively um, a small location. So we'd say that for the most part, there's a random distribution. of nutrients. So now let's say there's like a river here. And in this river, the shrubberies grow in high concentrations in certain spots. I got some random shrubberies growing here and there. But for the most part, they're growing only in these specific spots here. Okay? How would you describe the spots at which the shrubberies are growing? What? Selected? Selected? We remember this is ecology, so we want to go with like the least scientific words possible. Special. What? Special? No. <laughs> what? Predictable? No. Concentrated. E even, uh, concentrated would be a good one, but again, this is ecology, so we want to use a less sort of um, refined word, and we're going to call this clumped. <laughs> they are clumped together. So this is a clumped population distribution. Okay. And so, uh, what can we assume about those areas where there are a lot of shrubberies growing? High nutrient, High nutrient concentrations. But where are those high nutrient concentrations? In very specific areas. Okay, uneven 
distribution of nutrients. So there are areas where there are high concentrations of nutrients, but then there's also like this other random surrounding area where you don't have a lot of stuff growing. Okay. Last one. Something like that. Imagine that this happens without uh, any human interaction. What's this called? Even. Yeah, evenly spaced, I would think, is a good way. They, they do use a little more refined her, uh, term here, and that is uniform distribution. And uh, what can we assume about um, something that is has a uniform concentration? Yeah, they need a specific amount of space to grow. Specifically, they are going to um, compete within their own species. If another species or another plant pops up like here, they're like, nah, -uh, you're too close to everybody else, and they outcompete them, right? So this is generally uh, uh, something that arises from intra-specific competition. But you have to see that there is um, a you know fairly even distribution of nutrients. Now it doesn't have to be perfectly even, but they have to be able to survive in the other areas. Okay, so if this was a shrubbery, like maybe you know they're they're just blocking out the sun from other shrubberies that are around them. But in the case of like a, a bear or something like that, or a wolf. Maybe that bear is highly territorial, and so it protects the area, you know, one specific area. And the most awesome bear, the most, you know, uh, aggressive bear is the one that gets the area that's kind of the best. That's got, like, you know, uh, the river on it. It's got part of it that's got, the, got a river running through it. Maybe there's a bunch of, like, trout in that part of the river. And, like, that bear is going to protect that part of the river because that's his territory. And he's allowed to have that territory because he's, like, the most awesome, scary bear or something like that. Right? Okay. So, um, let's talk about populations as they uh, relate to uh, the climate. And I want to talk a second about this term, climate. As early as yesterday, uh, I read an article in the Washington Post uh, that was stupid. Uh, it, uh, it, it did not understand what the term climate means. Okay. Uh, in fact, the, ter the, the article said so it was like a, a big headline that said, um, 2016 reaches predictions for global warming for, or set for 2000, uh, or for the year 2100. Right? Meaning like it's as hot now as uh, global warming analysts thought it would be in 2100. Right? Now, is that true? Yes. The year 2016 has been extremely hot pretty much globally. Right? But the question is, is that headline valid? Is that he does that headline make sense? And the answer to that is no. And the reason for that is that climate refers to a very long period of time. Right? You can't just like take a snapshot of a year or a month or anything like that and say like, yeah, that's the climate. You have to look at a much larger sample than that and say like, here's the climate over the last 100 years. That's a decent sample of climate to say like, here's what the temperature was in the last 100 years. The 100 years before that was this, right? Because temperatures will fluctuate based on weather patterns and uh, solar flares and things like that, okay? So climate is um, weather patterns over a long period of time, okay? And then uh, in order to have that definition make sense, we gotta know what weather is. Weather refers to current 
conditions in a specific area. So you've got things like uh, uh, rainfall and wind and temperature. Everything that, that we talk about with weather, pressure, atmospheric pressure, those are all those all go into the weather. And then you gotta look at these things over a very long period of time to get what the climate is. Okay? So the question then is uh, what causes the climates? Why are there different climates in uh, or on the Earth? So why is the climate in Florida different than the climate in Ohio? Uh, why is the climate in Florida different than the climate in San Diego? So, why? What are some things that, that affect climate? Yeah. Um, like relation to like water and the sea. Yep. How close they are to bodies of water. So proximity. To bodies of water. And we talked about that at the beginning of the year. We said that water's got a really high specific heat, 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And so we know that uh, it's going to take a long time for it to heat up and also a long time for it to cool down. And it's going to release a lot of energy as it cools down and absorb a lot of energy as it heats up. Okay. Uh, as a result of this, water acts as a heat source during the nighttime when there's no sun energy, no solar energy, and it acts as a heat sink during the daytime when there's a lot of solar energy. So water acts as a heat source at night and heat sink during the day. Okay. Uh, I think at the beginning of the year we talked about uh, Las Vegas and we said uh, that in Vegas it's very common for the temperature to go up to like 110 degrees during the day, but then at night it drops down into the 60s, maybe even in the mid 50s. Uh, that's, that's a huge swing, a 50 to 60 degree temperature swing during the day or you know, through, through a one 24 hour period. And uh, the reason for that is because there's not a lot of bodies of water around and sand has a very low specific heat. It's like less than one. Uh, and when you compare that to water specific heat, which is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius, that means that uh, the water is gonna um, hold on to a lot more energy at night and it's going to absorb a lot more energy during the day. Right. Uh, we also, I think, talked about the fact that uh, if you go on the Las Vegas Strip, that the temperature swings are about 10 degrees less, and that's due to all of the fountains and water features and pools that are present in all those hotels and casinos, because uh, that again provides enough of this heat source, heat sink effect to uh, uh, make the the um, overall climate uh, or overall weather rather more stable. Okay. Okay. Um, what else? Proximity to bodies of water, what else uh, gives the climate, at least to different climates? Yeah? Would it be how um, close or far away they are from the equator? Yes, so we call that the uneven heating of the earth. Okay, and the uneven heating of the earth is going to lead to uh, some things. It's going to lead to uh, our wind patterns. And it's also going to lead to ocean currents. Okay, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, um, but I want to do some drawings, and so we'll get everything down first. One other really important thing, I think. Yeah. Elevation. Yep. Elevation and topography. That's like if there's mountains and stuff. Right? 
And so uh, elevation uh, is going to impact the air pressure. Uh, and then topography often impacts the wind patterns. And those affect things like temperature, but also things like precipitation. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the uneven heating of the earth. And this is something that it, this is definitely not like an earth and space science class or anything like that, but I feel like it's really important just like as a human to understand. And I feel like if you went uh, out on the street and you asked somebody um, why there were seasons, I would think like at least 50% of the time they would give you the wrong answer. And that I feel like is just really sad. So, uh, so we're going to look at, uh, at some Earths. Okay, here's an Earth. And then over here we'll make another Earth. I probably should draw the equator on first, but whatevs. We'll live dangerous, dangerously. All right, here we go. So here's the equator. And the Earth is tilted on its axis. The tilt is 23.5 degrees. It does wobble a bit, um, but not significantly. Okay. Now, um, when we are talking about um, about the Earth, it's important to realize there's two motions that are happening with the Earth. There's um, the Earth rotating on its axis, like this, right? And um, how long does it take for the Earth to go through one complete rotation? 24 hours. And the other thing the Earth does is it goes around the sun. Orbits. Right? How long does it take to go around the sun? 365 and some change. 365.24 days. Right? So, here's the sun. Warning sun not to scale. Also, sun shape incorrect. The sun is a big sphere. It's not this weird disky thing, but a giant sun sphere wouldn't fit in the middle of my two Earths. So this is what we're going to go with as the sun. And again, not to scale, you could fit way more Earths inside the sun than this. Okay, so this is the sun here. All right, now. What I want to illustrate to you guys, um, I've drawn the equator, but what I'm also going to do is I'm going to draw a uh, another line here. Okay. And now on this line, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to take a point, this point right here. Okay. And then I'm going to get the comparative point, which is going to be right here. You guys agree that like as the Earth rotates, this is the same point, right? And that uh, at one point in the year, uh, the when the the axis is tilted this way, that's going to be towards the sun. So this is daytime here, uh, and then when it was over here, it would be nighttime. And then now on the other side, it's daytime here, and then on the other side, it'd be nighttime, right? Okay. So uh, in order to sort of illustrate this, what I'm going to do is I am going to um, consider the. Oops, I'm going to consider the Earth as, or the sun rather, um, in units of sun. And each line on my paper is going to represent one unit of sun, okay? So if we look at um, specifically these units of sun, all right, so here's some sun units, one unit of sun and Two units of sun. Each of these um, units of sun that I'm putting here are going to um, have the same amount of relative energy in them. Okay, they are rays of sun, essentially. Sure. Okay. 
So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and try to put little hash marks in. And I'm going to try to be as, as good at this as possible. Put little hash marks in, evenly spaced, as evenly as I can. Like that. Okay? And now for this one, again, try to evenly space them. Okay, so you can see that on this side, I've put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hash marks in between um, these two lines. But on this side, I put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven hash marks. Seven and eleven. Uh, I have no significance in that. Uh, hash marks between these lines here. So this one has one unit of sun distributed over 11 hash marks, and this one has one unit of sun distributed over seven hash marks, okay? Which one gets a greater concentration of sun per hash mark? The seven one, right? That means that when it's on this side, when it's facing towards the sun this way, it is getting more sun per square foot of land than it was on this side, right? When it's facing away from the sun. Because um, when it's facing this way, the sun covers a much larger distance because of the curvature of the Earth. Okay, that means that in the northern hemisphere on the left side, we are experiencing summer. But in the southern hemisphere, they would experience winter. Okay, and then on the opposite side over here, the northern hemisphere is going to be experiencing winter and then um, the southern hemisphere will be experiencing summer. Now, uh, what happens, and again, remember the Earth is going around like this, right? So the Earth sort of does this. Okay, and when it's exactly lined up sort of at these 90 degree points here, Right? We call this point right here, this would be the summer solstice in, uh, in the northern hemisphere. Right? This would be the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere. What do we call it when it's right here and right here? Not solstice. Those are the equinoxes. Because at that point, the um, tilt of the earth is not tilted towards or away from the sun. It's tilted sort of on the opposite plane of the sun. Right? And so the uh, length of the day and night then is going to be exactly the same because you're not tilted towards it or away from it at, at all. Okay. And so this one would be between summer, or so the top one would be between summer and winter. And so that would be the fall uh, or the uh, autumnal equinox. And then this one is uh, between summer and winter. And so that's the spring or vernal equinox. Right? Does that make sense? If you ask most people on the street what causes the seasons, what do they say? No, I mean, that's what they should say. But they say that the Earth is further away from the sun in the winter, right? And that's false. In fact, in the northern hemisphere, the Earth is closer to the sun, ever so slightly, right? Uh, all right. Questions on this? All right. Um, I feel like... I feel like we should take some time um, just, again, to be better people. Um, when we're talking about climate, I feel as if it's uh, necessary to address this thing that we refer to as climate change. Uh, and I'm not going to do it from any preachy sort of way. Uh, maybe a little preachy. Uh, but but it's, it's a smart type of preachy, right? So there are three camps. Three camps of people when talking about climate change. Okay. First of all, there are people who are called climate change deniers who say that the earth is the exact same temperature that it's been forever, you know, blah, blah, blah. Those people are stupid, right? Clearly, that is not the case. You can very easily look at temperatures and say, okay, this hundred years has been significantly hotter than the last hundred years, right? So that probably means that the earth is getting warmer, right? Okay. So again, first two camps, climate change is happening. Climate change is not happening. This group is wrong. Okay. Now 
you can take second group here, climate change is happening, and you can divide it into two separate camps, okay? In these camps, I think both have valid points. You can both make arguments right, okay? So um, camp number one says that climate change is something that happens, right? Uh, historically, if you look back at, at you know, uh, all the historical data of uh, the Earth, we know the Earth has gone through lots of shifts, lots of warming periods, lots of cooling periods, uh, lots of ice ages, right? Lots of mini ice ages. And so they're just saying like, okay, it's getting warmer, but like that's something that happens. The Earth always gets warmer, right? Is that a valid argument? Yes, that's, that's a valid argument, okay? Camp number two is saying, hey, the Earth's climate is changing, uh, and it's probably because it's humans, because uh, even though uh, the Earth goes through these normal shifts, uh, it's happening like a hundred times faster than it should be happening, right? Is that a valid point? Yes, okay? So, so if you're going to make a climate change argument, your two valid climate change arguments are climate change is happening, and it's happening because it's a natural thing, or climate change is happening because uh, of what humans are doing, right? Those are the only two valid arguments that you can make. You cannot and should not ever make the climate change doesn't exist thing because you can just look at numbers and see that that is incorrect, right? Very easy to see this. Uh, there's, there's no denying it. All right. So uh, the second thing is um, why do we care? Death. Death is the important thing, yes, right? Um, I have a thing. Some of, my, some of my students made this for me a few years ago, right? It says, save the humans, right? And, and uh, it's got a little like recycling thing in earth on here, right? Because the really popular thing to say is save the earth, right? But who cares about the earth? First of all, uh, number one, uh, I don't care about the earth because I'm a human and um, I want to live for a long period of time and I want my offspring to live for a long period of time and their offspring and things like that, right? So save the humans, number one. Second thing is, no matter what we do, the earth will be fine. I promise. The earth is going to be here long after we're gone, right? We're not going to... I told you the average time that, uh, that uh, a species lives on earth is a roughly 2 million years. We're not going to get to that. No chance. I think that if we make it to the year 4,000, that's going to be freaking incredible. 3,000. That seems even pretty far off for me. Okay? The earth is going to be fine. The, the, the time period of a couple thousand years on the earth is nothing, right? And, and the earth is going to exist for a long time after that. And, and all we care about is making sure that humans are going to be around for as long as we can. Right? So is global warming important? Probably. Why is global warming important? Is the actual warmer temperature going to kill us? No. What's going to kill us? Well, maybe lack of food. Maybe it leads to more food. Maybe we, we rely on the oceans more. I don't know. The, um, what? Melting the polar ice caps and then what? Rising sea level, which means what? Less land. That's the really important thing. Humans live on land. Right? And there's an increasing number of humans. The Earth's population is going up. Increasing number of humans, decreasing number of land, amount of land. That seems bad, right? And so the humans are going to compete. And they're going to be like, hey, this is our land. No, this is our land. It's our land. And what do humans do when, when, uh, when they compete over land? They fight wars. Right? We don't fight wars with knives anymore. We got much cooler to more terrible ways to fight wars, right? Like nukes and stuff. So what's gonna kill the humans? Probably the humans, but it's going to be caused by this whole global warming thing that's gonna create all this tension that, uh, that will cause us to, in an, you know, actuality, kill ourselves. Anyways. So, so since like um, the average scale of peace is like two million years and we're probably not gonna reach there, like, are humans, like, maybe a bad evolutionary option, or because... Maybe. I mean, we're, we're kind of the smartest thing that's ever lived, and so maybe, like, being smart is bad. Crocodiles are the best predators to ever be on the surface. Swear to God, they've not changed for, like, a long time. They're pretty solid. <laughs> all of the yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, a couple more things, two more things real quick. Um, 
when we look at climates, uh, there's two distinctions. There's what we call a macro climate. Um, macro climates are just large areas with a very consistent climate. So when you look at, uh, um, you include, uh, you know, a very large point, you average out all of that space, the climates seem consistent, right? So large areas with consistent climates. Okay, and then within a macroclimate, you get these things called microclimates. Okay, and again, they exist within a macroclimate. And a microclimate is just a small area that has a significantly different uh, uh, set of weather patterns or set of conditions. Okay, so let's say that um, I go out and I'm, I'm walking around and uh, somebody has like some big landscaping rocks in their, in their yard, okay? And I take one of those big landscaping rocks and I pick it up and I roll it over, right? There's going to be stuff under it. There's going to be like worms and cockroaches and bugs and all living underneath this thing. And the reason why they're living underneath there is because it's a very different climate than the macro climate around. Florida's really hot. Right? But underneath the rock, it's nice and cool, and there's not a lot of sun, and it's damp, right? And so uh, the nutrient concentration is high. And so um, if you were to flip that over, then everything underneath it would die because now it's not in its microclimate anymore, it's in its macroclimate, and there's lots of things that can't survive in their own macroclimates. Okay?